Hello to all of the mid-American gardeners out there. We're so glad that you've joined us. A hint of spring, almost summer in the air. So we're glad that you tuned in because we wanna talk about all things spring gardening, growing things. Hi, I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. So my area will be cut flowers and landscaping with perennials. However, we have three highly talented people here with me today and I'm going to have them introduce themselves and their expertise so you can direct your calls and questions in that area of their expertise. Well, I'm gonna start with you first, Ella Maxwell. Well, hi. Um, I'm a horticulturist at Hare Nursery, and I can answer any questions for you on flowers or shrubs, trees. Um, I've, in, I've got a wealth of knowledge, and I wanted to give a quick shout out to the people that were in April in Paris in Edgar County. I did a program this afternoon, so I'm happy to be here. Great, and what is your your email or show and tell, what were oh, you wanted to do? I do, I have a question about beans. It's a, um, uh, they wrote in about a field of beans next to them that had some spray and they thought they saw a cloud come up over their, um, and across their garden and they're worried about whether or not this is damaging uh, their plants. So the first thing is they said that it was Roundup that was sprayed, and that is a non-selective herbicide that can damage plants. Um, but the pictures show these little dots, which might not be really from the Roundup. So it's important to find out what is sprayed. Uh, if you have some damage, or if you can try to wash it off rather quickly, it might mitigate some of that. And they were worried about some edible plants, whether or not they should eat them. And if indeed it was chemical damage, I would probably not. So wouldn't Roundup have bigger, or do you think it would be those small little It, it could dots. be. Uh, again, I, I question, uh, it didn't say the time of the year. Mm -hmm. Usually Roundup is applied um, earlier in the spring. Uh, there are Roundup ready crops out there that can have Roundup applied over the top. Uh, but uh, again, it's, it's hard to say. And you need a dialogue with uh, whosoever field that belongs to so that they understand if indeed there is some problems. Okay, well thank you very much for that. And we're gonna go next to you, Dave Plussard. Thank you, I'm Dave Plussard from the Garden Center at Hare Nursery in Peoria. I am the Garden Center Manager as well as one of the horticulturists there. And I am a certified arborist, so one of my specialties is trees. But like Ella and Karen, when you work in a garden center, you kind of get to know a lot of the answers because you get all kinds of questions. For instance, um, this isn't a question, this is a problem that I actually have in my own yard. This is a phlox, uh, the garden phlox. It'll get large pink flowers on it in the summertime. But and part of it, you see nice roots coming out. You don't see any roots down below it and you don't see any roots coming out in uh, the side of it. And that is because I have a problem in my garden from rodents called, called voles. That's V as in Victor, O-L-E-S. And they are like little mice. And uh, they are very difficult to uh, control and they are very destructive. You'll n often see that at, in the wintertime after the snow is melted, you'll have little trails in your lawn and uh, a lot of people don't know what that is, but that's from voles. And if you don't have a high population, it's norm normally not a problem. But I have actually had them eat the base of the bark around my tree, one of my trees, crab apple, and killed it, in addition to eating my flocks, eating uh, some of my perennials and things. So Ella gave me a solution that I thought was very clever. I know that you can control them like you would uh, the um, regular mice, so you can use traps, you can use baits, but this is one uh, type of trap bait that you can use where you take a mason jar, uh, you have the, the regular lid, and then you take the removable lid and you cut a V in it. And that V then allows entry for the vole into the jar. And so when it's on the jar, 
<clears throat> they'll crawl in and they'll chew on the bait and then they can get back out and hopefully they will die. In the process, you can see through the jar whether or not they're even eating the bait. So if they are not, then you just move the jar around the garden. And you normally, if you look at the website on U of I, they'll, uh, I think Sandy Mason says you may have to have as many as 15 of these around your garden so that you can get the, the voles under control. Uh, I dug in my garden and I tried to dig out all the areas. I found a couple of nests, found an area where they had buried a bunch of oak leaves. So uh, I know mm -hmm. I have a big problem. So this is what solution I'm going to use to get rid of my voles. So basically follow their run. Yes. And where they have some of the organic matter, mm -hmm. you situate it on the run. Yes, and they um, love to eat grass as well as all the other plants, mm -hmm. yeah. The only good thing that happened with the bowl, not, bowl, and I've told this story before, is they root pruned my Siberian iris and oh. made it very easy to <laughs> divide. Because those are tough, but that's the only good thing I've seen yeah. from that. Thank you for that dissertation about voles and showing the damage, because you can really see it on that. All right, well, let's go next to you, Karen Ruckel. Hi, I also work at Hair Nursery in Peoria, and I work uh, primarily in the trees and shrubs, but uh, I like perennials and annuals also. And I've got a question from Carrie Ann, and she's wondering about growing vegetables organically in containers and the best type of containers. And her concerns are with plastic pots, leaching chemicals, and is there a pure organic option available? I think this is one of those tough questions to answer that there's really not a true answer for it. With growing in containers, a lot of your vegetables, depending on what you're doing, tomatoes, you know, bigger is better for trying to grow them in containers. But if, if you're concerned about chemicals or what that container might contain or, or leaching, you know, certainly an unglazed clay pot would be a good choice. Um, not anything that is glazed because some of the glazing processes can leach different uh, okay. chemicals in through the plants. So I would go with the unglazed clay pot or if you want to do something bigger or that you won't move, certainly constructing a redwood box would would be a, a good long term for lasting of, of wood or long lasting container that would also then not have chemicals um, that would be a concern of your crops. But I, I think the one thing I would take away is always go bigger than what you think um, because of you want your vegetables in a sunny area and if they're drying out and you're watering them a couple times a day that's not the, a big enough container for that spot or you need to find a, a drip sort of uh, watering to keep them going. Very good. Bigger is better. That's what I think all horticulturalists like. Bigger is better. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Except sometimes with ponds. Well, that's true. <laughs> and insect and disease problems. You don't always want more well, yeah. than that. Okay, well, let's go to a special Did You Know next. Scarlet Pimpernel is known to forecast the weather. If the flower is closed, rain is coming. And if it is open, the day will be sunny. It is also called the poor man's weather glass. Okay, well, let's go to the phone lines. We don't have that many, but we do have one or two. So let's go first to Marlene's question about a peace lily on line one. Hi, Marlene. Hi, thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. I had a, a peace lily that was in a small container, maybe a four inch pot or so. And so I put it in a larger one. I thought it was getting too crowded. And it's just gone downhill ever since then. I don't know what I've done wrong. Okay. Peace lilies, I, I think, are, are a little tricky. Um, they are so susceptible to, to root rots, and they don't like being overly dry, and they don't like being overly wet. So I would say on your plant, if it was a four-inch pot, it should have only gone up to maybe a six-inch pot. And if, it, if that surrounding soil is staying too wet all the time, slowly that'll rot your roots out. So at, at this point, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing to do because you, you might have to undo what you've done and that could kill it. But if you don't do anything, it could still die. So I would say to maybe uproot it again, see how wet that soil is staying, tease out what roots are there. If they're white and healthy, pull off or trim off anything black or, or slimy and um, 
try keeping it lightly moist but not wet because like I said they, they don't like wet and they don't like being overly dry but um, I, I do find them kind of a sad plant with a lot of times you see them given as gifts and, and they just seem to be a little bit troublesome. They can really not have enough water quickly and they can have <laughs> too much. Well, okay. You know, I've had one from my father's funeral and it's it was in 2000, so 15 years and I water it only once a week. That's it. That's great because sometimes they just have a great spot they want to be and other times, like you said, they they're, they're unhappy. They're unhappy. Okay, well let's go to line two next. Line two, are you there? We can go to line three if that's the one. I can't read the monitor, so I don't know where we are. Do we have any callers? I'm on line three. I'm number three. Hey, line three, that's who we want to talk to. What's your name? George. George, what is your question? I have a lot of daffodils, and I've planted them over a number of years. They weren't all planted the same year. We've lived in this place 50 years. This year, very, very few of them are blooming. But usually, the, 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 where I haven't planted is just, you know, yellow, Dutch master daffodil. Right. Mm -hmm. And this year, there's very, very few blooming. And I just, I've never had that problem before. You're the second person I've heard say that today. And um, one of my colleagues, and he has thousands of them, he said very few were blooming. But he gave me an answer he thought might have been that he might have mowed them off or cut them back too soon. But you haven't. You haven't cut them back too soon last year, did you? No, no, I wait until that foliage is... That's what I figured, yeah. and I figured he probably did too. Does anyone want to give, um, I don't know what else, I unless was, they're super crowded. I was just reading an article recently suggesting that people forget to fertilize their bulbs, and often that, that is very helpful, so you can either use an organic fertilizer um, or, or a regular bulb fertilizer to fertilize them, and that may help it as well. And it can be low numbers. Yes, the bulb um, fertilizer is not very high. And it does need to be in as well. They didn't think that for a long time, but mm -hmm. low in. Nitrogen. Eventually, yeah, thank you. Eventually, you can divide them. And mine are just going like crazy, because I always go in and and divide and take out a few and start in another patch. So daffodils will occasionally get too crowded, but not for a long time. Mm -hmm. So anyone else want to jump in on, because mine are doing great this year. I've been really pleased. I think Dave's idea about fertilizing will help for next season. And I would definitely dig up one of the clumps just to investigate it further. Yeah, see to if see. it's gotten too deep, too crowded. Right. Okay. Well, hopefully next year it won't be the same way, but I do mulch mine and that breaks down and so it does give it a little bit of organic compost. All right, well, we're gonna go from daffodils to moss and let's go to line two with Dan. Hi, what's your question? Yes, uh, in my yard, I got moss growing different places. Uh, some places, you know, it's just a foot in diameter, some places four inch in diameter, some places whole side of the yard has just got this moss growing on it. Uh, how do I get rid of it? Moss is a caused by a kind of a complicated issue with your soil. You can get rid of moss by treating it with iron sulfate. You'll find like Scott's, for example, has a moss control product that you can use, but that's not really controlling the problem. That's just controlling the symptom. It's getting rid of the moss, but typically in a, in a lawn that has moss, uh, it can be too wet. It's too compacted. It doesn't have good aeration. Uh, fertility can be off. So one of the best things to do is to correate the lawn. And coloration is usually done either in the fall or in the spring. So this would be a good time to core aerate. Um, and a few people will even do it twice, but, uh, and sometimes you need to do it more than just once in a year. You, you may need to do it three or four or five years in a row. Is it a symptom of too much shade? Uh, shade can be a problem, but I've actually seen uh, some uh, moss in a sunny area, which okay. is really quite unusual. But I had a number of customers in years past, so I did a, kind of a lot of research with it on what University of Illinois recommends. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I got the fact that it's really not one thing, but a compilation mm -hmm. of, of things that cause it. We did come out of a beautifully um, even moist la season last year. That right. might have helped it too, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. 
because it would like moisture. So anyway, thank you for your question about moss and hopefully that gives you some uh, good tips. Let's go on to line four and it's about uh, pruning an old crab apple. Hi there on line four. Hello, I have a crab apple tree that's a good 100 years old. The Great. house was built in 1882 and it was, there's a picture of it in the front yard. Now, on my, the left side of it after this winter, I noticed one of the branches seems to be dead. Um, and I, but right a, right near the trunk, it has branches with buds on it. Do I cut it off or what? Do I cut off the dead part, leave it alone, or what? Well, what? yeah, Go you're ahead. you're always going to want to remove something that's dead. Uh, that's the first thing that you're going to evaluate when you're going to do pruning is something that's dead or diseased, broken, somehow damaged. So that, that's really all you'd need to do first is remove that dead wood and if, if that's enough, then you can stop. Uh, you might need to do some directional pruning because that mm -hmm. branch, um, but you could wait to see how it continues to bud out. What do you mean by directional pruning? Yes, that's a really good that's point. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Explain well, it. Uh, again, uh, if a branch has these buds on it or other branches, and uh, if you're going to cut back to another branch and it's growing towards uh, the center of the tree, you really want your um, branches or your buds to be outward facing, growing out. So that's what directional pruning is, is to try to get more branches going out to that left side to kind of fill it in and give it a nice form. Very good. Mm -hmm. Well, we're gonna go back to the phone lines in a moment, but let's do another round. And I'm gonna start with you, Ella. I see something show and tell, or are you gonna oh, do email? Oh, no, I'm going, doing spraying uh, asparagus. Carol writes, last year, Diane said that you can spray asparagus to control weeds and grass. Are I there did? special <laughs> precautions that you need to prevent killing the asparagus? Pre please review. Well, now is the time. The only time that you can really overspray asparagus is before it emerges from the ground. So you might be this weekend because I'm sure it's going to start popping soon and then you could use some type of herbicide even something like Roundup as long as the asparagus hasn't um, emerged. The best thing is maybe doing some hand pulling and mulching um, in the early spring or late fall I like to add compost and then a a nice layer of straw so that I'm ready to go in the spring and that's in the fall after I've removed the um, foliage. So you can't spray your asparagus once it's up. Once the weeds are uh, competing it's very difficult. You'll have to wait till fall or uh, again the following spring. I'm sure that's what you meant. And since I'm an organic gardener, I have never sprayed my asparagus. So possibly someone else on the show named Diane said that. But it's so easy to weed in February and March after the frost is out of the ground. Those weeds come out so easy that I would just hand weed them. May so, I make an observation on sure. that? You're talking about her hand weeding her asparagus, but she had poison ivy in that asparagus from what I saw in that picture that well, was on the it's, screen. Well, it oh, said it was not the viewer's image though, but oh, we did get okay. uh, poison ivy in there, so he oh, wanted okay. to be maybe... Poison <laughs> ivy is a little different. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but you're, you're one way or another, you have to get rid of it. But you well, you can just, just be aware that you're wearing like chemical gloves, long sleeves when you pull it out, and, and just be very careful. Some people I, are, are sensitive, yeah, I didn't sensitive and, and some and are not. Don't I didn't hear it. anything about poison ivy in that question, was there? <laughs> Oh, it's in, in the picture. The picture shows uh, poison ivy in it. Oh, okay. That's poison so ivy is totally different. <laughs> That's a problem. Yeah. No. <laughs> now you can, if you have to, you could do a spot cut end spot away from it and right mm -hmm. and pull as much as you can. Yes, I did say that for poison ivy, but I didn't realize there was poison ivy <laughs> involved. Okay, good. Thank you for clarifying that, Dave. That's very good. All right, let's go to you next, Dave. You're on. Oh, you get you to be nice. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Lynette from Will County has an amazing Grace Katsura tree that's planted on the east side of her corner lot. Last year and early this year, it seemed very healthy. Suddenly, the leaves began turning brown, and I can see some white spots. 
About 97% of the leaves fell after crumbling brown. Then it started leafing out again. Unfortunately, the leaves that have returned are again turning brown with some white dotting. And Katsura tree uh, tends to be a tree that likes it a little more moist. It certainly does not like drought. And when you see crumbling like that and the leaves getting crisp, one thing you might think about is that it's too dry, but I think in the situation, as you mentioned, it was not too dry, so that would indicate probably some sort of a disease that has occurred on the, the leaves, and it reoccurred when the new leaves came out. So you probably will need to have that identified. I'm assuming the plant clinic is mm -hmm. opening again at the U of I. You could send samples in if it reoccurs this year to identify what the disease is. and with trees and foliage diseases, you really need to have um, the spray on there before they leaf out. Okay, so we had the plant clinic information up on the screen for you. Thank you, Dave, and now Karen. I have a question from Ann about tomato worms, and uh, last year she had small worms in my tomatoes. Anything I can use for, on the plants this year to keep from getting them again? There's two different ways to go with this. One is, you know, if you like to use chemicals, there are a lot of vegetable dust and that would solve your problem. Um, in the instance more with people like Diane gardening and not wanting to use chemicals, I say when you see them, pick them off. So it's watching them that typically what I see on my tomatoes is either cut worms, they're a brown thick worm um, and they usually are, are pretty easy to see and yes, they've kind of destroyed one tomato, but killing them, you've, you've stopped them from going to another one. Or later in the season, tomato hornworms. They a lot of times will start on the foliage and then when they get desperate, they tend to move to the fruit. But um, I would just be on the lookout of that kind of that same weather time that you saw them last year and just start looking for them. And I would prefer to pick them off and not resort to a spray. A lot of your organic sprays aren't gonna impact a worm like that anyway. So it's, it's more just, you know, perusing those plants every day or every other day at least, looking on the fruits and catching that quickly um, so that they don't get too big and take out too many tomatoes. I like that, perusing the plants. <laughs> other people call it scouting the plant, but I like perusing. And if you're interested in gardening, that is not a problem to peruse. You wanna <laughs> see what's going on. Thank you, Karen. Well, let's go to line five, and it's a question about when to prune roses. Hi there, line five. Hello. What's Hello? your yes? Hi. What's your question? Uh, yes, I have roses here, a couple of them, and I'd like to know when I can prune them, or is it too late to prune them? This is an excellent question. Okay. It's not too late. No. You could prune them now, don't you agree? Oh, absolutely, sure. And the, I a noticed, month ago would have been too early. Yeah. So well, that's they good. have started leafing out, but that's not an issue with pruning on roses. So you definitely can go ahead and do it. So we wanted to get to that question because it's people have been asking it all winter and now it is just about right and it's not too late. Okay, well we're gonna go to line one and it's a question that Donna has about peach trees. Hi there, Donna. Hi, uh, I was wondering if, uh, if you plant uh, young peach trees, if you have to have two for them pollinate to make peaches. You do not, they are, they are self fruitful. And if there happens to be any place where you would get them, you should be able to read on most tags when you, apples you do need, pollination, cherries, I believe it is. Pie, uh, sweet cherries, but not pie cherries. That's correct, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, sweet cherries. So, so, you, so peaches, uh, the, the only disadvantage with peaches, I feel, is some winters, especially from the Peoria area, might be severe enough to not have a good flower set because the flower buds are damaged, but if you get flowers, you should get fruit, and many times too much fruit that you would want to uh, maybe thin it mm -hmm. or even brace the branches. So good luck with your peach crop. People hate to pull those peaches off to thin it, but it is so important, or you will just get little tiny fruit without much meat on them. So if you, if you thin them out, so you only have maybe two peaches per branch, you will have much bigger peaches with much more juicy tasting fruit. That's what I was gonna ask. So two per branch, like yeah. every, you know, just one branch has two on it. So that, that would have to be a heartbreaking thing for people to do. I find too, even uh, transplanting seedlings that I've 
sewn too thick. I have a hard time doing it, but it makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. You'll have little scrawny lettuces you need to, and it tells you how much to space vegetables, so two per six for peaches. Wow, this really goes fast. Don't you notice that? Mm -hmm. I find that uh, we have such good viewers, really good questions. We are thanking you for all of those questions. And you will see that uh, we have some promotional things that you might be looking at. And if you want to send in any questions, you can do it Facebook, email, and of course by mail. So we like to encourage you to do that as well. Well, I think it's time to be weeding. It's time to be sowing <laughs> seeds. A little bit of pruning, you can see at this time of the year, time to do it all. So um, get out there, just don't overwork. <laughs> so have a great week gardening. But first off, we want to thank our panelists. Thank you for being here. And we will see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>